All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. More folks may join us as we're going through some of the intro, but thank you everyone for being here today and welcome to Solar Oregon's How to Go Solar and Storage Workshop. My name is Abby Jager and I'm a program manager here at Solar Oregon. And this is a recurring workshop that we've been delivering to home and business owners across Oregon for over 15 years. Our mission with this program is to arm you as a consumer with the information you need to make good informed choices as you explore solar and or battery storage. Solar has changed significantly in the past decade and a half, and we update this workshop as conditions in the market change. Thank you so much for joining us today. So for, here's what we'll be going over today. We'll start by taking a look at how solar works. We'll see the components in a system, learn about a process called net metering that allows you to get credit for the energy you export to the electrical grid and see how solar saves you money on your utility bills. Next, we'll take a look at how solar contractors assess your home. We'll see common issues with your home that can increase the cost of solar installation or prevent you from going solar altogether. We'll then take a tour through the exciting topic of energy storage and see how a battery can allow you to use power when the grid is down. And we'll walk through several example budgets. We'll then wrap up by talking about contractor selection, the installation process. The point of this workshop is to get your questions answered. So after the main presentation, we'll have an extended Q&A session. Any and all Questions about solar battery storage or even related technologies are welcome, and we'll describe the Q&A function on Zoom here in just a couple minutes. So first, a little bit about Solar Oregon. Solar Oregon is a 501c3 nonprofit that has worked to encourage solar and storage adoption throughout Oregon for over 43 years. We do this by providing reliable and impartial consumer education, working to build the clean energy community, and performing outreach and some policy advocacy our main program and longest of one is this one right here, How to Go Solar and Storage Workshop. We also host solarized campaigns, solar tours, zero energy showcases, and expert panel discussions on a range of topics related to solar. You can support our work by becoming a member or donating today. We are a member-driven nonprofit, and we thank all our members for their continued support in helping make great events like this one happen. One of our upcoming events is our Shine on the Woman of Wine Solar Wine and Brews Tour. This is in just a week or so, but there is still time to register and get your spot. We provide transportation to both the OSU Solar Harvest Solar Agriculture Facility and then also to Top Wire's Tasting Room out in Woodburn, Oregon, where we will be featuring a number of great wineries and is a great opportunity for you to learn more about solar and support Solar Oregon while also having great wine. I'm also gonna put some links in the chat right now. These will be referenced throughout the presentation and also just contain some more information as well as my contact information if you have any questions after. Now this Presentation is made possible by the Energy Trust of Oregon. Energy Trust is an independent nonprofit established in 2002 that provides resources to help enable customers of the investor-owned utility, so PGE and Pacific Power, in Oregon to use energy more efficiently and gain access to renewable energy. They offer key incentives for solar installation and in 2022 were authorized by the legislature to offer incentives for battery storage as well. We thank Energy Trust for their continued support. Right now, I'm also gonna launch a few polls. These are just a few questions and are important for us in knowing what, who is here and who's in the room with us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, there's just one, um, two more polls, so really quickly.
And one last poll, this one is just covering your familiarity with some of the incentives we'll be discussing at the end of the presentation so that we can see how well we do in educating you. Awesome, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Um, the last housekeeping thing is for the Q&A at the end of this presentation. You can use the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your screen. It should look just like this little box that this orange arrow is pointing at. You can put any and all questions you have in there throughout the presentation. No need to wait until the end. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll just be going through those to help answer the questions that came up for you. Um, so if you have any issues finding that, feel free to write in the chat and either myself or my other coworker on the Zoom will also be able to assist you, but please put any and all questions in there. So without further delay, let's jump into our main presentation. So this here is a diagram of a typical home solar system. You can see the house in the middle of the diagram. Sunlight strikes the solar panel labeled here as a photovoltaic or PV panel and produces a voltage of electricity. This is a special type of electricity called DC electricity, which is different from the AC electricity used by lights and appliances in your home. That's why we have another special device called an inverter or microinverter that converts the electricity produced by your panels into the AC form used in your home. From the inverter or microinverter, the electricity flows into your electrical panel, aka your breaker box, and into all the circuits in your home. There it can power your lights, appliances, charge an electrical vehicle, and do everything you use electricity for. If your solar system is producing more electricity than you're using at any given time, the excess energy flows out of your home and onto the electrical grid. There it can be used by other homes and businesses in your neighborhood. At moments when you need more electricity than your solar system is producing, you can still purchase that energy from the grid. This is called a grid-tied solar system. When you go solar, you get a special utility meter that measures the flow of electricity in both directions. This allows you to use a system called net metering, which gives you credits for the electricity you export to the grid. We'll cover net metering in more depth on a later slide. So that's a solar system. It's pretty simple. There, that's one of the reasons that solar is so popular is that it's pretty low maintenance. So now let's take a look at some of the different components of the system. First off, we have the inverters. There are two options available for inverters, normal inverters and microinverters. The white box in the image on the left is an inverter. It accepts electricity from all of your solar panels at once and converts it. The inverter is typically installed on the wall immediately next to your electrical panel, aka your breaker box. However, if space is not available near the breaker box, it can also be installed outside. In this case, there could be extra cost due to longer conduit units. The smaller black box pictured in the image on the right are microinverters. These are installed immediately beneath your solar panels and microinverters take in electricity from only one or two of the solar panels at a time. So here in this image, we are actually looking up at the backside of the solar panels, if you can imagine that. And as you can see, rather than there being just one of these microinverters, there are multiple within this image as they only take electricity from one or two panels. Both inverters and microinverters are great options that are installed frequently in Oregon. Your contractor may suggest one, or one over the other based on the specific needs of your system. Next up is mounting. Solar panels can be mounted either on your roof or as a ground mount. Roof-mounted systems account for the vast majority of solar installed on homes and businesses, especially in dense urban areas where ground space is not available. Ground mounting systems can be a great option for people, families who have more space. However, they still need to be wired into the home's electrical system, so there can be extra costs due to needing to run the conduit lines. Um, but both are great options, just depending on the space you have available. Now, the vast majority of solar installed in Oregon looks like the solar panels we've been showing in the previous images. However, there's another technology that is frequently talked about, and that are solar roof tiles or solar shingles. This is a roofing product that both protects your home from the elements like a roof and generates electricity like solar panels. Multiple brands of solar tiles exist, but most solar installation companies do not install them. If you're interested in exploring this product, you'll need to seek out a company that specializes in them. 
This technology is significantly more expensive than regular solar panels, and additionally, the installation process is much more complex. We recommend that you find an experienced team for your project and you ask your contractor how many solar roof tile systems they've installed and if you can speak with any past customers about their experience. It's also important to note that many price projections have been made in the future about the price of these decreasing. However, the industry has not progressed as quickly as some have promised. If you're set on solar roof tiles, we caution that waiting for price improvements may be waiting for longer than you may expect. So as mentioned earlier, when your solar system is producing excess electricity, it gets exported to the grid, where it can be utilized by your neighbors. Net metering is the process that allows you to account for the energy you export so you can gain credit for it. Let's illustrate how this works by walking through two examples, a typical sunny summer month and a typical cloudy winter month. The graph on the left shows us what's happening in a summer month. The orange bar shows how much electricity you've produced with your solar panels, and the blue bar shows how much you've used with all your lights, appliances, and outlets. Because you've produced more than you've consumed, this is a month where you're exporting electricity. The green arrow shows the difference, which would become your net metering credit earned. The graph on the right shows a typical winter month when you're using a similar amount of electricity, but your solar system is producing much less. The red arrow shows the amount of electricity you'll need to purchase from the grid this month. With net metering, the credits you earn during the sunny summer month offset the electricity you purchase in the cloudy winter. While your net metering credit does roll over from month to month, it's important to note that it does not roll over from year to year. The net metering year begins on April 1st. This allows you to build up credits during the sunny summer months and use them all winter long. Any excess credits you have on March 31st First, are forfeited and donated to low-income families. So that is net metering explained in the most simple terms possible. We're next now going to be going through what a typical electricity bill might look like so you can see how those net metering credits are set. This is an example from a PGE customer, and we're going to walk through some of the details. In the box on the left, you can see the period for which you are being billed, the reading on your bi-directional meter at the beginning of the month, and the meeting, uh, reading on your bi-directional meter at the end of the month. Thanks to your new bi-directional meter, the electricity you import from the grid is recorded separately from that which you export. You can see the total amount of electricity coming into your home this month was negative 327 kilowatt hours. This means you exported more than you earned and you have now gained 327 kilowatt hours of credit that you can use later. Because you are a net exporter this month, your billable kilowatt hours is zero. Now, and we can also see that your year to date banked excess credits are 3,072 kilowatt hours. These are the net metering credits that, you've, that this customer has earned so far and will be able to use in the winter. Now in the box on the right, you may notice that the bill is not zero. This is because all utility connection comes with an $11 base charge. This is what all utility customers pay to be connected to the grid. This helps pay for repairs and other routine maintenance. In this example, there is also $1.63 of taxes and fees, which are itemized out as individual charges, leading to a total bill of only $12.63. Now compared with the average Oregon utility bill of $70, this is a great deal. And it is an example of the savings you'll receive on your electricity bill each month for the useful lifetime of your solar system. Now solar is a highly modular and residential solar system very widely in size. System size is measured in a unit called kilowatts and the average residential system in Oregon is eight kilowatts. What determines your system size by far, the biggest constraint is how much electricity you consumed. As mentioned, net metering credits do not roll over from year to year. That means you get the most value out of your system if your system is designed to meet but not exceed your estimated annual consumption. Your contractor will ask you for a past electrical bill to determine your future needs. And if you're expecting to make any changes to your home, such as switching between gas and electric appliances, purchasing an electrical vehicle, or adding or removing members from your home, whether that's having a new kid, having a family member move in, or a child leaving for college. 
these are all important things to mention as they will change how much electricity you use and how big your system should be. Other factors that can limit your system's size is roof space, budget, or limitations placed by an HOA or condo association. And it is important to note that it is illegal in Oregon for HOAs to tell you you can't go solar. However, they can impose restrictions on how you go solar. If you have any questions or are currently arguing with an HOA yourself, you're welcome to reach out to us here at Solar Oregon for more information or for any assistance. So that's an overview of how solar works. Now let's take a look at aspects of your home that can make it easier or more difficult to go solar. Regardless, regardless of your location in the state, the orientation of your roof has a big impact on solar access. This diagram shows a home and its orientation with respect to the cardinal direction. The arcs over the home show the path of the sun in the summer and the winter. Regardless of the season, the sun will always be in the southern sky. This means that south-facing roofs are ideal for solar. However, both west and east-facing roofs can work great in cloudier parts of the state. Roofs facing due east can be significantly less effective. This is because clouds tend to persist through the early morning, blocking some of that sunlight. The only roof planes that consistently don't get installed on are north, northwest, and northeast facing. As you can see in the diagram, the north side of this roof really does not get any direct sunlight. Now, even if you have a perfectly south facing roof, shade from objects like trees and buildings can prevent you from receiving enough solar resource. However, it can be hard to self assess whether shading whether the shading your roof receives will negatively impact you. Your solar contractor will be able to assess this for you with precision, either using special measurement devices or satellite-based software. And having big old trees like we have throughout Oregon is wonderful, and we definitely do not recommend cutting those trees down in order to get solar. The complexity of your roof can also impact your ability to go solar. Solar systems can be split into several sections and span multiple roof planes. However, the ideal roof will allow for a single continuous installation on one roof plane. The image on the left shows a roof with a complex roof geometry. Although there are many roof areas facing south, most are too small to install panels. And any system your contractor could fit there would be broken up into multiple smaller rays. The image on the right, however, shows a roof with a great continuous area on which to install solar despite its overall small size. Possibly the biggest factor that can affect whether you're able to go solar is your roof condition. Your roof will need to be replaced when it reaches the end of its lifetime, and when you do this, you'll need to pay a solar contractor to uninstall and reinstall your system. This service can cost upwards of 10 grand, so it's very important to plan ahead for this reason. We strongly recommend that you have 20 plus years of roof life when you install solar. Different roof types have different lifetimes with metal roofs typically having a much longer lifespan. However, virtually all roof types work well with solar. If you're needing to re-roof in the next few years, you should wait until that time to install solar. Finally, what's underneath your roof can also affect how easy it is to go solar. In order to get to the building permits for your installation, your contractor will get inside your attic and check the structure of your roof. Note that some jurisdictions are pickier than others in general. Portland has much stricter requirements than all other parts of the state. Newer homes tend to have trusses, which are pictured on the left. The extra vertical and horizontal support beam meet even the strictest requirements for solar. Older homes tend to lack these extra support beams as shown in the attic on the right, and will just have rafters extending from the eave to the crest of the roof. In this case, your contractor may need to hire an engineer to perform calculations for the permitting office. Based on these calculations, your jurisdiction may require that your contractor install structural reinforcements, which can add added costs. In rare cases, your home may not be able to meet local code requirements, even with reinforcements. You may also be prevented from going solar if your attic is inaccessible or there is not enough room for your contractor to perform reinforcements. Now let's go through the new and popular topic of battery storage. It's important to note that your solar system by itself does not allow you to use your solar electricity during a power outage. To do this, you'll need to add a battery. The ability to use power when the grid is called down is called energy resilience. Solar and battery storage are complementary technologies. Solar makes the battery more effective by recharging it, and your battery allows you to access your solar independently from the grid. 
Here's an example of a home with solar in storage. Solar on the roof and a battery in the garage. Power outages vary in their causes and their frequency and duration. Frequent short outages are usually caused by either storms or squirrels. In some areas, slightly longer outages in the summer months can be caused by red flag weather conditions, whether that is where there is high fire danger. In, for anyone in the Portland area, for example, we have been in red flag fire conditions for the last three days. At these times, utilities may perform what is called a power safety public shutoff, where they intentionally turn off whole sections of the grid if they are concerned about a wildfire breaking out due to the power lines. The first of these kinds occurred in Oregon in 2020, and they are expected to increase in frequency. In the Pacific Northwest, we also face the risk of a large earthquake, the Cascadia earthquake. When this event occurs, it is thought that power may be lost in the Willamette Valley for up to six weeks. On the coast, that power may be restored, may not be restored for several months. It is important to know what type of outage you're expecting to endure so that your contractor can design a system that will meet your needs. And it is also important to set your expectations correctly. Solar and storage technology can typically provide power for short and medium length outages, but it can be prohibitively expensive to prepare for an extended outage event. When it comes to picking a battery, there are many good products on the market. However, due to manufacturing certification requirements, many contractors specialize in one brand. For this reason, if you want to compare different battery technologies, you may need to compare quotes from multiple contractors, which, are, which we recommend you do anyway. And it is important to note also you cannot mix and match battery brands, though some battery manufacturers have different sized battery modules that can be combined. This means that if you were to buy, let's say, a Tesla Powerwall now and later would like to add a second battery to your home, you have to again get a Tesla battery and you cannot get a new brand. Most batteries have between 9 and 14 kilowatt hours of capacity. Some manufacturers make smaller units, typically around 3 to 4 kilowatt hours, and some make super-sized units with up to 20 hours, 20 kilowatt hours. The majority of batteries on the market intended for homes attached to the grid are one of two chemistries, nickel, manganese, cobalt, which have a lower price, or lithium, iron, phosphate, which, which have a longer lifetime. It is very important to set your expectations about what a battery can do and what it cannot do. Even if you do not use electricity, a single home battery will almost never back up your entire home for a meaningful period of time. However, you can do what is called a partial home backup. In this scenario, certain circuits in your home will receive power from the battery, but the rest of your home will lose power during an outage. If you're able and willing to front the extra cost, multiple batteries can allow you to achieve a whole home backup. However, this process is prohibitively expensive for most consumers, but is a simpler and more efficient process overall. When you get a partial home backup, the way you divide your home into sections that are backed up and sections that are not is based on the breakers in your electrical panel. When you selected which circuits you'd like to receive battery power, your contractor will remove those breakers and place them in a newly installed smaller essential loads panel. This second electrical panel will be wired to the battery. The battery system sizing process will entail a detailed conversation with your contractor balancing your desired functionality with your budget. A great way to think of this process is the trade-off between two questions. What needs power and for how long? Items most frequently chosen to back up include a refrigerator, lights in common areas, and a couple of outlets to be able to charge a laptop or cell phone. If you're interested in installing a battery, when you install it can affect both the system design and the price. But generally, there are two options. Install solar and battery at the same time or add a battery to an existing solar system. Homeowners with existing systems will, of course, be limited to the later option. Why can the timing of installation affect the design of your solar system? Each system is designed in a custom way to best fit your needs, and the components are selected to match one another as closely as possible. This minimizes the cost to you and allows for immense flexibility of solar. However, this flexibility during the initial design means that adding new components afterwards, like a battery, may require more parts and labor than if you had incorporated them during the initial design. For these reasons, um, in addition, the Oregon Solar and Surge Battery Incentive is only available if you install a battery at the same time as your solar. 
For these reasons, installing a battery after the fact can cost up to 10 grand more than incorporating it in the initial system design. Now, it is also important to note that battery storage can require a significant amount of dedicated physical space. Excuse me. They are ideally installed immediately adjacent to your electrical panel, which is typically in the garage. Insufficient space is available for some or all equipment. An exterior wall can also be utilized. However, this comes with additional conduit, which increases cost and in some cases can be aesthetically unappealing. So here, right here, we have an example of a system. This one here is a large four battery system, but you can get an idea of how much space these batteries take up. Now let's take a look at some of the great incentives that exist for solar and battery storage and walk through a few quick example budgets. There are two main incentives available to homeowners going solar in Oregon. The solar investment tax credit offered by the federal government also called the Residential Energy Tax Credit and the Energy Trust of Oregon Standard Solar Incentive. The ITC is a 30% dollar for dollar tax credit, meaning that you can reduce the taxes you owe by 30% of the cost of your system and or battery storage installation. This is an incentive that you don't receive immediately. You must apply for it when you file your taxes. And it, you can also, if you note that if you don't owe enough taxes in the year of which you install, you can claim this credit over the course of several years. The Energy Trust of Oregon standard incentive is a flat $500 for 400 apologies, $400 for PGE and $500 for Pacific Power customers that you receive immediately while installing solar. This is an incentive that you your solar installer applies for you on your behalf and it is deducted from the cost of your system. It is important to note that in order to receive this incentive, you must have your system installed by an Energy Trust trade ally contractor. We will talk more about what that means in the final section of this workshop. If your utility is not PGE or Pacific Power, you will not qualify for the Energy Trust of Oregon incentive, but you may receive additional incentives from your utility company. The ability of these incentives varies and you should check with your provider. Now, a really quick disclaimer before I talk about the solar tax credit. Solar Oregon is not a tax professional, and the information we're about to tell you is for educational purposes only. Do not interpret anything you hear today as official tax advice, and please consult a, a tax professional. That being said, here are some things to know about the investment tax credit. The investment tax credit covers the cost of both solar and battery storage. It applies to traditional solar panels as well as solar roof tiles. The incentive is straightforward, easy to claim, and it's helped countless homes and business owners attain solar since 2006. However, you are ultimately responsible for making sure you're claiming this correctly. Myths and con misconceptions do exist about what is exactly covered by the tax credit. The most common is that re-roofing costs can be claimed, which is a myth. If you're claiming this credit on your own and have questions about what expenses qualify, you should seek guidance from a qualified tax professional and not believe what you read online. Beyond the ITC and Energy Trust standard incentives, there are two incentives available only to income qualified homeowners. One is the Energy Trust of Oregon's Solar Within Reach incentive. Solar Within Reach is a dollar per watt incentive and allows Pacific Power customers to reduce their installation costs by up to $6,000 and PGE customers can reduce their costs by up to $7,200. The income threshold for qualification is relatively generous. For example, a household of four qualifies for solar within reach if their total income is less than $112,860. You can find the cutoff for all household sizes on the Energy Trust website, which is linked in the chat. The second income-based incentive is the Oregon Solar and Storage Rebate. This provides up to $5,000 for solar and up to 2.5 thousand for battery storage if installed at the same time as solar. This was recently refunded by the Oregon State Legislature. However, they have not released details yet on how much of that funding will be going to the general fund versus low and moderate income fund. So, but be aware it is refunded for at least the next six years. Yay, Oregon Legislature. Before we look at some examples of budgets for solar and storage, we should recap the reasons why both solar and storage battery costs vary so wildly. So as we've discussed, when it comes to solar, the size of the system, the re-roofing, structural analysis, 
and access to incentives can all impact the cost. And when looking at battery storage, whether it is installed at the same time as solar or later, the number of batteries, if you are creating a partial home backup, whether or not installation is far from the electric panel and access to incentives can all impact costs. So now we're gonna walk through some example budgets. So here's an example budget if you are just interested in getting solar. Um, in First we have a column detailing the cost for an eight kilowatt system, and then we have it split into the two different main utility providers, and then also if you are income qualified. So if you are in Pacific Power or PGE, you can qualify for the Energy Trust Incentive and receive that at 500, 400, 6,000, or 7,200. And you could also get the state rebate up to 5,000 each if you are low or moderate income qualified. That brings your out-of-pocket costs prior to receiving the federal tax incentive to 31,500 or 31,600 for pack power and PGE customers or down to 21,000 and 19,800 if you're lower moderate income and also receive solar and reach as well, I forgot to mention. You then have the 30% federal tax credit, which as I said, you would get later when you do your taxes and that is brings the total final cost to consumer before energy savings to 22,050. 22,120, and then 14,700 for pack power and 13,860. Now, if you're getting solar and storage installed at the same time, we are getting an eight kilowatt solar and a 10 kilowatt hour storage. The cost of foreign incentives will be 44,000 across the board. You receive the all the incentives and you also get an increased battery incentive. If you are lower moderate income qualified through the Oregon Department of Energy rebate program. And then you also can claim the 30% redeeming your out-of-pocket costs down to 43,500 or 43,600 for pack power and PGE or 30,500 and 29,300 if you're lower moderate income qualified. You then get the 30% federal tax credit covering all your remaining expenses, bringing your final cost before energy savings, the 30,450 or 30,520 if you are high income. And then if you're lower moderate income qualified, 21,350 or 20,510. Now to explain again, if you're adding storage after solar, so this is the same size system and same size battery, your cost of solar and your cost of battery added after is 23,000. However, the main difference here is you do not get any battery incentives, whether or not you are lower moderate income. So this is zeros across the board. You still, then you have your out-of-pocket costs and then your final cost before energy savings because you're not getting that um, incentive is 38,150, 38,220 for pack power or PGE, and 30,800 or 29,960 if you are lower or moderate income qualified. Because solar and battery storage entail large upfront costs, as we just saw, many homeowners utilize financing. Some homeowners obtain a loan through a bank for which they have an existing relationship, but some banks do not provide loan products specifically tailored to solar. Your contractor may partner with a credit union or third-party broker that offers a package that is geared towards solar. These types of loans may allow you to refinance when you claim the ITC, which can minimize the total interest you owe on your loan. Note that interest payments on your loan do not qualify for the tax credit. As with any major financial decisions, make sure you assess your financing options. Now let's finally take a look on how to select a contractor and what to expect during the installation process. Besides offering incentives for solar, Energy Trust of Oregon has a certification program for contractors to help ensure high quality of workmanship. Energy Trust trade ally contractors have been rigorously vetted and are the only contractors you can offer you the Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Incentive. We highly recommend working with a trade ally contractor. When you're ready to quote from contractors, there's an extremely convenient tool on the Energy Trust website that you can use to request free assessments from three highly rated trade ally contractors in your area. This online form takes only three to five minutes to complete and is a great way to make sure you're getting connected with companies that can best serve your solar and storage needs. And in addition, only 
Freight Ally contractors can't get you that Energy Trust of Oregon solar incentive. The link to this um, form is in the chat. Once you've selected your contractor and signed your contract, here's what you can expect regarding the installation process. Your contractor will handle all permitting, apply for the Energy Trust and Oregon State incentives on your behalf, and design your system. Although system design can be quick, some jurisdictions have been experiencing permitting delays for all types of construction projects since the pandemic. These days are particularly bad in Portland. For this reason, you can expect that installation may happen two to 12 months after you sign your contract. However, once it's time to break ground, installation is very quick. Most residential systems are installed within one or two days, making it a relatively painless process. After the system is installed, your contractor will manage your permit inspections, coordinate the installation of your new meter, and schedule your interconnection with utility. This can take two to three weeks after that after you've been interconnected, your system will be producing clean, renewable power from sunlight falling on your property. Yay! And so that is it. We now have time for the q and I'm going to take a drink of water and then we'll get started on that. Feel free to put your questions in the chat in the meantime. And thank you so much for everyone for coming today. So the first question we have is someone asked, um, is they say they can only put panels on a flat wall due to snow and only a few. What they really need is a battery and generator set up to run during um, public power shutoffs and other um, grid failures. Can they add a generator to a system? You can definitely interconnect a generator to a solar system. I don't know many of the details on that. I'd imagine you would hook it up similar to how you would a regular generator, um, but I don't know all the details. I definitely know people who have solar and use a generator rather than a battery backup. Um, I'm unsure if you can charge a battery using a generator or what that would look like either. Uh, I'm sure you could find more information on that online. Um, you can also add a battery without adding solar, though I'm unclear what incentives you can access in that scenario. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Happy to try and answer. We got the question of if the process is different for a new house that is being constructed with solar in mind. If you're building a house from the ground up, it's a great thing to talk to your contractor about. You can, there are houses being built now that come with solar, though that is not quite as common in my experience and what I know of. Um, there are also many homes being built being called what is solar ready, where they are not being built with the solar panels, yet all the infrastructure and they are being built so you can very easily just put the solar panels right on without any issues. Um, most new construction will also have a stable enough roof where that is a pretty easy thing. You're not going to need to worry about doing that extra engineering. So that is how that works. Definitely it's something to talk to your contractor about. I don't know what the incentives would look like. That would be a great thing to talk to your contractor about um, again, but the process would be relatively the same. And you could, if your contractor is not familiar with solar, you could always ask them to build solar ready. And then once you move into the home, you can manage playing on the solar yourself, working with a solar contractor through the Energy Trust of Oregon. And then you can be sure you're accessing all the incentives. While folks are thinking of questions, I'm going to launch one last survey. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be great.
thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I can stay on a few more minutes if anyone has any final questions, but otherwise, thank you. Feel free to check out our website to learn about more great events we have going. And otherwise, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.